Hi, Daniel Botkin here. Uh, welcome to HRN. Uh, if you watched some of these teachings I've been doing uh, for the past several weeks, I've been teaching about um, the book of Joshua, crossing over the Jordan, and uh, relating that to our walk with the Lord, how we all each have our Jordan rivers to cross over, where we cross out of the wilderness, go into the land of promise, and we take hold of our inheritance. We have to fight for our inheritance. And um, what I want to do in these next several weeks is just continue on this theme. However, I want to continue on this theme by going into the next book of the Bible, the book of Judges, because the book of Judges follows the book of Joshua, and uh, the book of Judges gives us a lot of uh, it gives us a lot of wonderful illustrations from these stories about taking hold of our inheritance after we've crossed over, after we have entered into the land. So, in the book of Judges. Each tribe of Israel was given a specific territory. They were assigned a certain territory with boundaries, and they were to go in there and conquer that territory and eliminate the Canaanites, drive them out, and establish the authority of God in their territory. And our Joshua, Yeshua of Nazareth, he has given each one of you a territory. Now, I'm not talking about a geographical territory, but I'm talking about in the spirit realm. He has given you a territory to spiritually conquer. Just as the first Joshua gave each tribe a specific area to conquer, so our Yeshua has, he has a specific plan for your life, is what I'm trying to say. He has a plan for you to uh, find and to follow. And he expects each one of you to discover what is his plan for me. And then when you discover that by his power and by, his, by faith in him, you go forward and you conquer the enemies that are there to try and hinder you from taking hold of, of your territory, from fulfilling the plan that God has for your life. Now, when you, you find out what God's plan for your life is, and you go forward to try and fulfill that plan, I've got some news for you. You are bound to make a few mistakes along the way. And uh, if, if we look at the book of Judges, we're going to see that people made some mistakes. And hopefully by looking at the book of Judges, that can help us avoid making some of the same mistakes that we read about in the book of Judges when the Israelites went into the promised land to conquer their territory. Now, the book of Judges, as I said, it begins right after Joshua. And it begins immediately after the death of Joshua. And uh, the first chapter it, of, of uh, Judges, it talks about the tribes of Israel going in there. Each one had their territory, and each one was to fight against their enemies. And the first chapter, it, it, um, it tells about a few victories, of course. But the first chapter is also marked by the disappointing record of Israel's failure to completely fulfill their destiny in their generation. And, and let me read to you, this is out of the first chapter of Judges. It says, And Yahweh was with Judah, and he drove out the inhabitants of the mountain, but he could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley, because they had chariots of iron. So that's, a, that's Judah's territory. Then it mentions the children of Benjamin. It says, And the children of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites, neither did Manasseh drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shean and her towns. Then a few verses down, it says, Neither did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites that dwelt in Gezer. A few verses later, Neither did Zebulun drive out the inhabitants of Ketron. Neither did Asher drive out the inhabitants of Akko. Neither did Naphtali drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh. And the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountain. So here in this first chapter, from the very beginning of getting in there, of course, you know, they got victory at Jericho, and that was wonderful. The walls came down, and and they went forward and they conquered other territory. But we see here in this first chapter of Judges, it's kind of a disappointing record of incomplete victory. Even though the children of Israel went into the land, they took the land, but they couldn't quite get complete victory over the enemy. And like these Israelites, many of God's people today, Messianic Israelites, we accept defeat too easily. We accept incomplete victory, that some people, they, they will tolerate sin in their lives, and their epitaph is going to be similar to what we just read from this first chapter of Judges. Our epitaph might say something like, and the disciple John Doe, he overcame his drinking problem, but he never could overcome his addiction to pornography. He had to give in to that temptation once in a while when he was on the internet or whatever, and he, he just never quite got victory over that addiction. And uh, Sister Jane Doe, she overcame her bad temper, but she never could quite overcome that urge to gossip. So she missed out 
on the, the ministry that the Lord had for her. See, doing the will of God is serious business. It's not just a game. God says to each tribe here, he said, you know, here's your territory. Here are the boundaries of your territory. Now go in there and fight for it. And he says to each one of you, I've got opportunities for you. I've got a, a plan for your life. Here are the opportunities. Now you go in and you fight for those opportunities. And we have to realize that we will not fulfill our destiny in this life without a fight because there are Canaanites. There are invisible demonic entities that work behind the scenes to orchestrate events, to bring about circumstances that are designed to frustrate your efforts to fulfill the plan of God for your life. Um, you know, each one of us, uh, we've got, God took hold of us for some reason. You know, Paul, the apostle in Philippians 3.12, his, his burning desire, he said that I may apprehend that for which I was apprehended. You know, that's King James Version. Uh, one translation says that, that I may lay hold of that for which Messiah laid hold of me. See, Paul knew that when the Lord laid hold of him that day on the road to Damascus, you remember the story, he was on his way to persecute believers. Uh, he wasn't looking for, for uh, the Messiah named Yeshua. He was fighting against him. He was opposing him. And then he was arrested. He was apprehended that day. And he knew it was for a reason. He knew that when God apprehended him, that he was apprehended, he was laid hold of for a purpose, for a reason. And he was determined to find out why did he save me? What did he save me to do. It wasn't just to sit on a church pew for the rest of my life and sing a few hymns and throw a few dollars in the collection plate. He saved you for more than that. So we need to have the attitude that Paul had that I want to lay hold of that for which Messiah laid hold of me. I want to find out what did he save me for? Why did he save me? Because he has a job for me to do and he has a job for each one of you to do. And these Canaanites, these invisible demonic forces will fight against you with temptations and trials and disappointments and discouragement. And like the Canaanites of old, they, they're not going to leave without a fight. They will do their damnedest and pun intended because they, they are damned, they are condemned by the Lord to get you to sin. They will try to get you to sin. If they can't get you to sin, then they'll bring in so much disappointment and discouragement to try and make you just kind of give up and just settle down and say, I'm done fighting. I'm just going to take it easy. I'm just going to settle for a lukewarm sit in the pew on Sunday morning or Sabbath morning church life and uh, settle for an incomplete partial victory. See, we cannot be satisfied with partial victory in our lives. We need to have as our goal to have complete victory over temptation. And uh, if we settle for partial and complete victory like the tribes of Israel did, you know, what's it going to do? It's going to be our epitaph. Well, he overcame this, but he couldn't quite overcome that. So what are we going to do? Settle for incomplete victory or fight against temptation, against sin, against every weight that prevents us from entering into the fullness of our inheritance. Now, a lot of people you know, they'll have a, you know, a fairly good walk with the Lord, but they've got some problems here and there, some weaknesses and flaws and some temptations they give into here and there. And they try to justify their failures by comparing themselves to other people. You may be a woman at work. She'll say, well, I may flirt with other men at work, but at least I'm not committing adultery like Sister X does. You know, the tribes of Israel could have had that same attitude. They could have said, yeah, well, you know, we Ephraimites, we quit fighting at Gezer and let the Canaanites remain among us, but so what? The other tribes didn't quite get complete victory either. See, we can't compare ourselves to other people. You know, Paul the Apostle said that it's foolish to do that. He spoke about people who were foolishly measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves. That's from 2 Corinthians 10, 12. And so people's standard becomes, you know, the average believer. But our definition of spiritual success must not be just the average Joe Christian. Uh, you know, we have to quit thinking that God grades on a curve. No, God's standard, you want to know God's standard, you look at the record of the Messiah in the Gospels, and there you will see God's standard. That is our standard. Don't, don't, uh, don't, value, don't um, measure yourself by comparing yourself to other believers. Because it's easy to find believers that are more carnal than you. I mean, it's, it, you know, it's easy to do that. So quit comparing yourselves among other believers and just compare yourself to the Lord 
whose victory was complete, whose obedience was complete, and let that be your goal and press forward. See, God's attitude toward quitters can be seen in the second chapter of Judges, okay? First chapter of Judges, we saw a list of incomplete victories, how the different tribes didn't quite overcome, you know, this area, that area, this group of people, that group of people. And in the second chapter of Judges, we see what God's response to that incomplete victory was. It says, And an angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I made you to go up out of Egypt and have brought you unto the land which I swear unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. Ye shall throw down their altars, but ye have not obeyed my voice. Why have ye done this? This was the Lord's response. And then it goes on to say, The anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he said, Because that this people hath transgressed my covenant which I commanded their fathers, and have not hearkened unto my voice, I also will not henceforth drive out any, drive out any from before them of the nations which Joshua left when he died, that through them I may prove Israel whether they will keep the way of the Lord to walk therein as their fathers did keep it or not. So because of their incomplete victory, because they had settled for second best, they had just been satisfied with partial victory, the Lord said, okay, I'm not going to be with you. I'm not going to drive these people out. I'm going to leave them among you to prove you to see if you will be faithful or not. And the reason for Yahweh's anger against his people, it can be summarized in four words. And remember these four words. They all start with A, so it's, it's fairly easy to remember because you're going to see this progression in the book of Judges. And you, if you study church history, you see the same progression in church history. And in an individual disciple's life, if you're not careful, the same four steps can happen in your life. And the four steps are apathy, apostasy, anomianism, anarchy. Let me talk about those words. Apathy, what is apathy? Apathy, it's just indifference. It's uh, an apathetic person says, I don't care. You know, apathy is very dangerous because if you're apathetic and somebody tells you you're apathetic, guess what? You don't care because that's what, the, apathy by its very nature is just apathetic. So apathy means you don't care, you're indifferent. Apostasy means departure away from the truth. Anomianism, the nomos is the Greek word for law, and then the a prefix means negative, not. So anomianism is a departure from God's law. And anarchy, the arche means first primary ruler, uh, and then the an prefix means not negative. So anarchy means th there are no rules. Every man does what's right in his own eyes, and that's, you, you could summarize the book of Judges with that phrase, every man did what was right in his own eyes. So these four steps, apathy, that will lead to apostasy, apostasy will lead to anomianism, and anomianism leads to anarchy. So the apathy is recorded in chapter 1 of Judges, where the different tribes just had partial victory. Then chapter 2 talks about the apostasy. Chapter 2, it says, And they forsook Yahweh and served Baal and Ashtaroth. That's in Judges 2.13. And this apostasy led to anomianism. It says, They went a-whoring after other gods and bowed themselves unto them. They turned quickly out of the way which their fathers walked in, obeying the commandments of Yahweh, but they did not so. See, anomianism is lawlessness. And without law... That evolves into anarchy. And the anarchy in the days of the book of Judges, it was eloquently expressed in the very last verse of the book of Judges that summarizes the spiritual condition of God's people during that period of history. The, it, the book of Judges ends by saying, In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And that's what some people want. They want everyone just to do what's right in their own eyes. And this progression from apathy to apostasy to anomianism to anarchy, it bears a striking resemblance to what happened in the history of the church. As a matter of fact, you could take those four words and make a four-part outline for a course in Church History 101. You know, point one, apathy, then apostasy, then anomianism, then anarchy. And furthermore, I can't help but notice a remarkable parallel to church history in the account of Joshua's departure from this world and the events that transpired in the very next generation after Joshua. See, when Joshua was alive, 
things were okay. Joshua was in charge. He was the anointed of the Lord. He knew what he was doing. He had the blessing of the Lord. He was faithful. And it says in Judges 2, this is verses 7 through 11, And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, meaning the elders of Joshua's generation, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. It says, And also all that generation were gathered under their fathers. So all of Joshua's generation died off. And then listen to what happened after that generation died off. It says, And there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works that he had done for Israel. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Baalim. And we could rephrase that passage of Scripture and say, The people served the Lord all the days of Yeshua, our Joshua, and all the days of the apostles who lived after Yeshua's departure, that generation who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did in the book of Acts, etc. But then in the following generations, things started to go downhill. Things started to decline. Immediately after Joshua came apathy, apostasy, anomianism, and anarchy. And the generation immediately after Yeshua and the apostles and their generation the same thing happened. Apathy in the ranks of Christians started even before the apostles were dead. Because how do we know that? Because Paul, in writings in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, <clears throat> he wrote about the apostasy. Uh, now, you might not see it in uh, some Bible translations. Uh, it's called the falling away in the King James Version, but the Greek word there is apostasia, where we get our word apostasy, the falling away. <clears throat> And in that verse, Paul talks about what he calls the mystery of lawlessness or anomianism. He said, it's already at work. And this is the significant thing we need to see is that something was happening in Paul's own lifetime before Paul and that generation had even died off that Paul called the mystery of anomianism, the mystery of lawlessness. He said, it is already at work. It's already happening. Jude mentioned it. He said, certain men have crept in unawares. John the Apostle wrote about it in his epistle. He said that uh, Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence, comes in and casts the brethren out of the church. Now, let me ask you something. If Diotrephes casts the brethren out of the church, who are the people left in the church? They're not brethren, are they? Because the brethren have been cast out of the church. So in the apostles' own lifetime, things were set in motion. This mystery of iniquity, this mystery of lawlessness, of anomianism was already, the tares had already been spread, they had already been sown, and they were starting to, to come out in the, the apostles' own lifetime. And so after the apostles and their generation died off, the church gradually be, took on this uh, this antinomian, anomian attitude and abandoned the Torah, not all of the Torah, obviously, but certain parts of the Torah, leaving Christians to decide for themselves what's right in their own eyes. And it's been that way uh, ever since then. Nevertheless, the scripture says in the book of Judges, after it talks about what happened there, it says, nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges, shoftim, which delivered them out of the hands of those that spoiled them. Now, in English, when we say judges, you know, we might think of in the courtroom, the, the you know, the, not the hammer, what do you call that? The gavel. We're not talking about that kind of a judge in the courtroom. The shoftim, the judges, they were simply deliverers, saviors. They were men and one woman, Deborah, who rose up to be uh, leaders of the people to deliver them to victory, to overcome the enemy. God raised up judges to deliver them out of the hands of those that spoiled them. You know, when the, the Canaanites were there. And this too we see in church history. Throughout church history, you see that certain periods of revival, certain men of God that God raised up to bring revival and reform in the church and so forth. And as Israel awaited the arrival and coronation, of a, a king, because you know between between Joshua and Samuel, you had no king in Israel. It says there was no king in Israel in those days. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. But Israel's going to have a king. They're going to have King David, an anointed righteous King David. But in the meantime, God is raising up individuals to turn the people back to God to bring some relief and deliverance. And we are waiting for the coronation of our king. Yeshua, the son of David, Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, to come as our king 
the son of David. And in the meantime, God will raise up judges, if you will. He will raise up leaders to help bring some relief and deliverance to God's people. And so that's where we're at in history, that we're in a similar uh, period of history now that the people in the time of the judges were. Between the time when Joshua and his generation died off and, and uh, God's people fell into apathy, apostasy, anomianism, and anarchy, and now the judges are being raised up to bring them out of that and bring them some relief and deliverance, that's what's happening now at this time in history, that God will he'll anoint certain individuals and raise them up, and he might raise you up to be one of these deliverers, because a lot of them are needed, because we got a lot of people that need deliverance. So as the church has waited for the return and coronation of King Messiah, son of David, God is graciously raising up individuals to repentance and revival throughout history. And let's pray that he raises up some judges in our generation to lead God's people out of sin and apathy and error and to get back to the old paths, to get back to the ways of the Father. Now, as we look at the various judges of Israel in this uh, series of teachings that I'm going to do, one thing we're going to see is that God uses uh, ordinary common things as weapons to defeat his people. We're going to see that God sometimes used simple weapons like an ox goat in the hand of a shepherd, or a hammer and a tent peg in the hand of a woman, or broken pitchers with torches and shofars, or a millstone dropped on the head of a man by a woman or in the case of Samson, the jawbone of an ass to slay a thousand Philistines, that God just uses these common ordinary things that have no inherent power within themselves, and yet God uses these as instruments to defeat the enemy. And we're going to also see that God uses common ordinary people. Now, when I say ordinary, I don't mean average. I just mean ordinary people, just flesh and blood, imperfect human beings like we all are. And some of these people, some of these judges, you're going to see they were the type of individuals that people in those days would not expect God to use. To use. Uh, some of the judges were what you could call socially stigmatized. For example, we're going to look at Ehud, a man who was left-handed. And uh, that was considered kind of, you know, you're left-handed, you know, there's something wrong with you. Or uh, Deborah and Yael, two women that were women because God, they didn't expect God to use women then. Or Jephthah, who was a, an illegitimate son of a harlot. Or Samson, who was a womanizer, and yet God used the man. So in spite of the flaws and the weaknesses and, and some of the foolishness of some of these judges and the foolishness of the weapons like an ox goat or the jawbone of an ass or uh, you know a, a tent peg and a hammer, in spite of that, God used these people and these kind of weapons to deliver his people. And that should encourage us because what are we? We're just ordinary people. We're not angels from heaven. We've got our flaws. Uh, you know, I'll be the first to admit that I'm imperfect and my wife will probably be the first one to second that motion because she knows me better than anybody else. So we don't claim to be perfect people, but God will use us and he can use you. You don't have to have some kind of, uh, you know, special training and degree and, and some uh, title to be used by God. So that should give us hope that God can use us because God used these judges, he used these people, and that should encourage us to hope and trust in the Lord to move on our behalf. You know, when, you know sometimes you can see your own flaws, you see your own weaknesses, and you can get a little discouraged and think, oh man, I'm not going to be of any use to God because I, you know, I messed up here, I messed up there, I can't do this, I can't do that. You know what? There, there are some things all of us can't do this or can't do that. There are a lot of things I can't do, and I don't try to do the things I can't do. But I do want to do the things that I can do by the Spirit and power of God. And the use of foolish instruments for spiritual weapons, it's interesting that uh, it, that finds its parallel in Paul's statement in 2 Corinthians 5, 4, where Paul said, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. So we don't trust in weapons that are carnal, that are uh, you know, of this world. Uh, we don't need, you know, literal swords and, and guns and things like that to fight our spiritual battles. Nothing wrong with having a sword or a gun. But when we're talking about spiritual battles, spiritual battles are not won by carnal weapons. Spiritual battles are won by the power of the Holy Spirit and the Lord using instruments and vessels and people that may seem somewhat foolish and flawed. You know, Paul pointed out also in 1 Corinthians, he said, uh, he said, 
that God uses things that are foolish, weak, base, and despised. Why does he do that? Paul says, so that no flesh should glory in his presence. See, if God just uses ordinary people and ordinary things to, to bring victory to his people, no flesh can glory in his presence. Paul also said that there are not many wise, when he's talking about the type of people God calls, not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. I say, yep, that's us, all right. There's hope for us. I told my congregation once, I read that passage, and I said, you know, God uses all these things, weak, flawed, uh, you know, ignoble things. I said, hey, there's a lot of hope for our congregation because that is us. So that should fill us with hope, with expectation, as we look for the Lord to move in our generation. And uh, we'll be back with you in just a couple minutes here, so stay tuned, don't go away. Thank you for your time. I'm Daniel Botkin from Gates of Eden. I appreciate those viewers who are watching the program and who are watching other programs of other teachers on this network. We appreciate your support financially, prayerfully, and your words of encouragement. Stay with us. Shalom. Okay, welcome back. We're going to continue looking here at, at uh, the book of Judges. And um, as I said, God just uses ordinary people. Now, the very first judge we're going to take a look at is a man named Othniel. And uh, Othniel was the first judge of Israel in the book of Judges, and his career, if you want to use that word, his ministry, his calling as a judge, is summed up in just three verses in the book of Judges. This is out of Judges chapter 3, verses 9 through 11. It says, And when the children of Israel cried unto Yahweh, Yahweh raised up a deliverer to the children of Israel. Now remember, why did they need a deliverer? Because remember, the angel of the Lord had come to Bochim and rebuked them for their incomplete victory and said, because they are turning away. And I, he said, I'm going to leave the spoilers. I'm going to leave your, your oppressors here in the midst of you. I'm not going to drive them out. So they needed some deliverance because they were being oppressed. So Yahweh raised up a deliverer to the children of Israel who delivered them, even Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. Remember, Caleb was a Kenazite. And so his younger brother, Othniel, it says, And the Spirit of Yahweh came upon him, and he judged Israel and went out to war. And Yahweh delivered Hushan Rishat Chaim, that's a long name, Hushat Rishat Chaim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand, and his hand prevailed against Hushan Rishat Chaim. And the land had rest forty years, and Othniel the son of Kenaz died. Now, the mention of Othniel's connection to Caleb in this short passage suggests that Caleb probably had a good influence on Othniel. Uh, Caleb's influence is certainly apparent in an earlier passage about Othniel, where it says, uh, this is in Judges 1, verse 12 and 13, it says, Caleb said, He that smiteth Kiriat Sefer and taketh it, to him will I give Achsa my daughter to wife. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, took it, and he gave him Aksa, his daughter, to wife. So Caleb was probably a good role model for Othniel, the first judge. And Caleb, of course, you remember, he was the only man of his generation who was allowed to go in with Joshua into the land of promise. All that generation had to die off. Remember the 40 years in the wilderness because the people refused to go in at God's appointed time. God said this whole generation is going to die in the wilderness. Only Joshua and Caleb are going in of this generation. Everybody 20 years old and up is going to die, and the, it will wait 40 more years. So Caleb was a good role model for Othniel. Uh, Caleb and Joshua, the only two men of their generation who had the faith to enter into the promise of God. And, uh, you know, Othniel, we don't know a whole lot else about him, but who knows whether Othniel would have had the faith to take that town of Kiryat Sefer and to later become the first judge of Israel without Caleb as a role model and a motivator by offering his daughter as a wife. Now, if we want the Lord to raise up judges in our generation, if we want God to raise up people who will bring deliverance, who will uh, drive the enemy away, we need good role models like Caleb. We need good role models and we need motivators, people who will be role models, who will motivate us by the walk they have and by the fruit they are bearing, where we will look at people and say, that's the kind of person I want to be. I want to bear the fruit like he's bearing. If the Lord can use him, maybe the Lord can use me. I, I look at him and I see a good role model. Now, we have good role models in Scripture, obviously. You know, we can look in the Bible, we can read about different people of faith, 
You know, Hebrews chapter 11 lists a lot of them. And in post-biblical times, biographies of great saints, great men and women of God. Uh, I like to read biographies of, of famous Christians that, that can inspire and strengthen our faith. But you know what? It's not good enough just to have role models in biographies or, or even just in the Bible. These, yes, these are role models and they're important role models. But you know what? We also need living flesh and blood role models because I think sometimes... We'll read about the people in the Bible, or we'll read biographies of, of dead saints, and we think to ourselves that they were somehow, uh, you know, they're on a different level, or they're, they're almost like they're an angel or something, that they're not like us, that, they, that, that we somehow think that they were above being human or something. That's why we need living flesh and blood role models. And we need to be living flesh and blood role models for one another, for our own children and for one another. And Othniel's biography here in Judges, even though it's brief, that can serve as an example for us. Because like Caleb, Othniel had the faith and the courage and the eagerness to go for it. Caleb said, here's the prize, my daughter, Achsa, she must have been a beauty because he, he said, I'm going to go take that city without hesitation. He saw the prize. And he was the first to go forward and win the prize. And uh, Caleb's daughter, Aksa, she's mentioned here by inspiration of the Holy Spirit and not by mere chance because the, the Bible's inspired by the Spirit. You know, love is blind, they say. And Othniel, when he saw the beauty of the prize, his love for that prize made him blind to the size and power of the enemy he was going against. Because you notice different places where the enemy was coming against Israel. The Lord would say, you know, don't look at their numbers. Don't look at their size. You know, don't look at their weaponry. Don't look at how powerful the enemy is. Trust in the Lord. And so we need to do that. You know, to have such a love for the prize, you know, Othniel was willing to risk his life to obtain the prize that was set before him. And when we see the beauty of the prize the Lord offers us, eternal rewards in heaven, eternal glory in the age to come, we should be inspired and filled with faith and courage to even risk our life, if need be, to go for that prize. And we shouldn't be intimidated by the size and the power and rage of the enemy that comes against us. Paul said in Philippians 3.14, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Messiah Yeshua. And that should be our attitude, to press toward the mark for the prize. When Othniel became Israel's first judge, it says, the Spirit of Yahweh came upon him. The Spirit of Yahweh came upon him. And here, too, is a lesson for us, because too many times we want to do something for the Lord, but we're trusting in something other than the Spirit of the Lord to bring it about. You know, we sing that song from Zechariah 4, 6, Not by my, nor by power, but by my Spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. And yet, are we really trusting in the Spirit of the Lord of hosts? Or are we trusting in our own might, our own power, or our own money, or our own ability, or our own talent, or our own cleverness? You know, maybe this is because the power of the Holy Spirit has never come upon us like it did to the apostles. Or maybe we're just trusting in some clever, you know, method that we've devised as a substitute for the power of the Spirit coming upon us. We need the power of the Holy Spirit to do the work of the Lord. Uh, yes, we need money to do the work of the Lord. Don't let me discourage you from sending in money to Hebrew Ru Hebraic Roots Network. We do need money to do the work of the Lord. We do need opportunities. We do need tools. We do need things. We do need stuff. We do need methods. We need all these things. But above all, we need the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We need men of God who are filled with the Spirit. E.M. Bounds, is a, a, he was a, I think he was a Methodist uh, preacher who lived during the Civil War, and he wrote a lot about prayer. You can get a big, thick volume of his writings on prayer, and it's very inspiring to read, and it motivates you to pray. Let me read to you something that E.M. Bounds said in, in a passage called Power Through Prayer. He wrote this. He said, we are constantly straining to devise new methods, new plans, new organizations to advance the church and secure enlargement and efficiency for the gospel. The trend of the day has a tendency to lose sight of the man or sink the man in the plan, of or, of, in the plan or organization. 
God's plan is to make much of the man, far more of him than of anything else. Men are God's method. The church is looking for better methods. God is looking for better men. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The dispensation that heralded and prepared the way for Christ was bound up in that man, John. What the church needs today is not more machinery or better, not new organizations or more and novel methods, but men whom the Holy Ghost can use, men of prayer, men mighty in prayer. The Holy Ghost does not flow through methods, but through men. He does not come on machinery, but on men. He does not anoint plans, but men, men of prayer. And that inspires me and urges me to become a man of prayer more than I am, because I realize God uses people, people filled with the Spirit. You know, we have our methods, we have our things, we have our stuff, we have, you know, the, the, the stuff we need to do the work of the ministry, but above all, we need the anointing of the Holy Spirit, which is only going to come as we become men and women of prayer and get that anointing. So in these times of apathy, apostasy, anomianism, and anarchy, that's really our, our only hope is the power of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of Yahweh came upon Othniel, and he became Israel's first judge. And this, this coming of the Holy Spirit upon Othniel, this sets the pattern for all the subsequent judges. We're going to see this is what happened to the other judges. They were just ordinary people, and the Spirit of the Lord would come upon them. And it, we're just ordinary people, and by God's grace, may the Holy Spirit come upon some people in this generation to be raised up to become judges. Now, after Othniel, the second judge of Israel was a man named Ehud. And remember, after Othniel was judge, it says the land had rest 40 years. And the transition from Othniel to Ehud, uh, we can read about in Judges chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. It said, and the land had rest 40 years, and Othniel the son of Kenaz died. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of Yahweh. And Yahweh strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done evil in the sight of Yahweh. Now you're going to see here in the book of Judges, you see the same pattern. The people fall into apostasy and anarchy, and then they get oppressed by the enemy, and they cry out to the Lord for deliverance. Oh, we're sorry. Please forgive us. And the Lord would have mercy and raise up a judge and bring them some deliverance. But, and then as long as the judge was alive, the people were walking in righteousness and holiness. But then after the judge died, the people would fall back into apathy and, and all these other things. They would fall back into, into apostasy. And then they would be afflicted again, and so they would cry. So it was just this cycle that would be repeated over and over and over again. And here it happens. When Othniel delivered them, they had rest for 40 years. But then after Othniel died, the people started doing evil in the sight of Yahweh again. And so Yahweh strengthened. Now, now get this. He strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel. Here was this heathen, pagan, idol worshiper, and God strengthened him to come against Israel. See, if th this should be scary. If you fall into the same pattern as the people did, if you get apathetic and you drift off into apostasy and anomianism and anarchy and all these things in your personal life, you know what? The enemy, the Lord will strengthen the enemy to come against you. God will give the enemy license to come into your life and to oppress you because he wants to bring you to repentance. It's a chastisement. So Yahweh strengthened Eglon, king of Moab, against Israel. Why? It says, because they had done evil in the sight of Yahweh. <clears throat> now, after the death of Joshua and his generation, the next generation had fallen into sin, and it says, the Lord sold them into the hand of Hushat Rishat Haim, king of Mesopotamia. Then after eight years, God delivered them, restored them through Othniel's leadership. And then after the death of Othniel, they repeat the same cycle of apathy, apostasy, anomianism, anarchy. And then after 18 years of oppression under the hand of Eglon, king of Moab. So 40 years of rest, then 18 years. That's, a, that's quite a long time to be oppressed by the enemy. 
But 18 years, Eglon, king of Moab, is oppressing them, and the children of Israel cry out to the Lord. And so the Lord has mercy, and he raises up another judge, Ehud. Now, Ehud was not the sort of man that people would naturally expect to be a leader. Uh, he was nobody special. He was just a man from the tribe of Benjamin. And Benjamin, you remember, is the smallest of Israel's tribes, the least significant. And furthermore, Ehud was left-handed. And uh, then left-handedness was viewed as kind of a stigma. Now, according to the Stone Tanakh, the Stone Translation, uh, they've got a footnote. They say that Ehud's left-handedness was due to the fact that he had a withered right hand. And they base that on the Hebrew text, which reads, Iter yad yamino, which uh, literally says his right hand was closed up. So he may have had a withered right hand. Of course, that makes him not a very likely candidate to be a judge because you're expecting some big muscular warrior, you know, like in the movies to be the judge. But here comes a man. He's left-handed because his right hand's all withered up. But in spite of Ehud's handicap, he was the man God chose to lead his people during this period of apathy, apostasy, anomianism, and anarchy. And the Lord's choice of Ehud should remind us that when the Lord is going to choose someone to do a work, the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Those were the words that were spoken to Samuel the prophet when he went to anoint one of the sons of Jesse. Remember that you know, David's elder brothers came through one at a time, and he thought, surely this one's the Lord's anointed. And then he said, no, you know, the, the Lord's not looking, he's not looking necessarily for people that are handsome and tall and strong and muscular and, you know, perfect looks and, and uh, perfect eloquence and all that. No, he's looking for people whose hearts are right. David was a man after God's heart. And God's people today, they're looking for spiritual leaders. And a lot of people, they're looking for spiritual leaders, but they've, they're looking for the wrong kind of spiritual leaders because a lot of people, they've got this mental picture of, uh, you know, their version of the ideal pastor in their mind. And they think that the ideal pastor, I'm looking for the ideal pastor. And he, he's going to, his preaching and his teaching is going to be in the style that I prefer, that I like best. And all of his doctrines and beliefs are going to line up 100% with all my doctrines and beliefs. And he's going to be active in the church functions that are important to me. And he's going to be on call 24-7. And he's going to work long hours for a small salary. And he's going to be tall and handsome. He'll dress in a way that pleases me. And he'll be an intelligent, dynamic man with great authority. Of course, he won't use any of that authority to interfere with my life, but that's the ideal pastor I'm looking for. And people, they've got this idea in their head and they're looking for the ideal pastor and they get frustrated because they can't find the guy anywhere. Their version of the ideal pastor, like the perfect church, is non-existent. Now, I'm not telling people to be content with imperfection. I'm just saying be realistic. Your ideal pastor does not exist. The man that you are looking for does not exist. Everybody's imperfect. Learn to live with it. Don't be content with imperfection. Pray for people that are imperfect. If you see people's flaws, pray for them, but be realistic. Wake up and realize God is probably not going to use your non-existent ideal pastor to deliver his people. He's probably just going to use people who don't fit the image, like Ahud, a man with a withered right hand, a left-handed man, just ordinary people. Ahud did not fit the image that people had of God's anointed. Nevertheless, he was God's choice. And the Lord knew what he was doing when he chose Ehud. Ehud was, uh, he was sent to deliver a tribute that Eglon demanded from the children of Israel. See, Eglon, the king of Moab, he basically, he, he came in, he established his authority there in the land, and he demanded tribute from the children of Israel, which was basically extortion money. He said, look, you want to stay at peace with me? You're going to have to pay some money here. And so Ehud was sent to deliver the tribute that he demanded. And the oppression and bondage the Israelites suffered under Eglon and the Moabites, it's a picture of how our enemy, the devil, will spiritually oppress and ensnare God's people. Now let's look at some of these characteristics of Eglon and the Moabites. Now who were the Moabites? You might remember Moab was the son and grandson of Lot, because Lot had relations with his own daughter, and she called his name Moab, which means from father, because that's where her baby came from. So Moab was, was born from this unholy, incestuous union. Now there's a lesson there. Fornication always carries with it the possibility of conception. You know, every time a woman gives herself to a man, there's a possibility that a new life might be conceived and born. 
And in the same way, every time a child of God gives himself to sin, anytime you give in to some sin, that unholy union carries with it the possibility that something might be conceived, a Moab might be conceived. And by that, I mean a besetting sin. See, there are sins that you can commit. You commit a sin, you can repent, ask forgiveness, and you can go on, and maybe you'll never fall into that sin again. But there's always the possibility that it can become a besetting sin, a habitual sin, an addiction that you cannot break. In the story of Ahud, the Moabites can be viewed as those sinful habits that become so deeply ingrained that they seem to almost like they possess a life of their own. You know, that's what addiction is like. It's almost like this, this something inside the addict that just demands, craves and demands that they give in. And just like Eglon, the king of Moab would demand his dues at a fixed intervals of time, every, you know, every so often payments due, payments due, besetting sins seem to roll around on a regular basis. It's that time again, time to pay your dues. Yeah, we know you want to serve God with all your heart, but you know that you've got this weakness, you have to give in, you've got to cave into this temptation once in a while. You've got, you got to let me have a little bit of you, and uh, I'm not going to leave you alone until you do, so you may as well just, just give in to the temptation Get it over with, and then I'll leave you alone for a while. That's how besetting sins work. For some people, their besetting sin, their Moab, their Eglon, might be something like drunkenness. You got to get drunk once in a while. Maybe it's only once or twice a year, but you know you got to do it once in a while. Or maybe it's some form of drug abuse, or maybe for some people it's telling lies or stealing or pornography or sexual immorality. You know, we can go on and on. But it's like a schoolyard bully that comes along and, and extorts insurance money. You want to stay at peace with me, you got to cough up a few quarters here. Well, maybe now it's in dollars. When I was a kid, it was dimes and quarters. But it's like a schoolyard bully that demands extortion, demands some tribute to stay at peace. That's what these besetting sins are like. And they roll around on a regular revolving basis. And it's interesting that this revolving nature of these sins can be seen in the name Eglon. The king of Moab's name was Eglon because Hebrew Eglon can be traced back to the Hebrew verb agol, which means to revolve. So isn't that interesting that eglon, it, it comes from a verb that means to revolve because, you know, it's like this rotating sin. So a besetting sin is a habitual sin. It's not just a, a one-time stumble, take you by surprise, and then you, no, it's a sin that rolls again and again. It rolls around. It's a stronghold in the mind. And the scripture says eglon was a very fat man. And just as Eglon and the Moabites, they grew fat on the tribute money that they extorted from Israel, so the Moabites in your life will grow fat on your surrender to temptation. The more you give in to these sins, the bigger and more powerful they become. They feed on your surrender to them. And the longer you remain in bondage to that sin, the harder it becomes to break free. But Ehud decided, you know what, we've had enough. We're going to break free from the hold of Eglon and the Moabites. And so Ehud decided to do something about it. What did he do? It says he made himself a two-edged sword, a cubit long. That's about from elbow to fingertip. Not a real long sword, but long enough to do the job. And it says that he strapped it onto his right thigh under his clothes. And after he brought the tribute money to Eglon, he said he, he told Eglon he had a private message to give him. And after they got alone, he told Eglon, I have a message from God unto thee. It says, Scripture says, Eglon stood up, Ehud drew his sword with his left hand and thrust it deep into the fat belly of Eglon and killed him. It says, and the haft also went in after the blade and the fat closed upon the blade so he could not draw the dagger out of his belly. And it says, and the dirt came out. The dirt came out. And this action of Ehud, it shows us how to deal with the Eglons and the Moabites that keep us enslaved to besetting sins. Ehud, first of all, he faced the evil taskmaster. And in the same way, if you have a habitual besetting sin, you need to face it. You need to confront it. Quit ignoring it. Quit pretending it's not there. Quit telling yourselves it's really not all that bad to, to occasionally give in to this. You have to quit thinking that it's normal for God's people to pay tribute to besetting sins every time that temptation rolls around. And you have to take a 
two-edged sword, the word of the Lord, plunge it deep into the bowels of those vile sins that demand tribute. That's, isn't that how our master resisted temptation in the wilderness? When the devil came against him, he said, it is written, it is written, it is written. And each it is written is like a thrust into the belly of Eglon, of the, of the tempter. And so we have to go on the offensive against the enemy, attack them with the sword of the spirit, the word of God, press it deeper and deeper into the belly of that besetting sin. So it, the, the, and until it says, and the dirt came out, the dirt came out. Eglon was dead. Ehud blew a shofar at Mount Ephraim, cried, follow me, for the Lord has delivered the Moabites into your hand. And then he led the Israelites to victory. Moab was made subject to Israel then. Then the tables were turned. The former oppressors were now subject to God's people. And this part of the story shows us what the Lord wants to do with the Ehuds, the judges of our generation, after they have conquered the besetting sins in their lives. See, if you get, overcome the temptation and the besetting sin in your life, you can blow the shofar, so to speak. You can proclaim to others, look, we don't need to be in bondage to this stuff anymore. We can be free. The power has been broken. That, that it's been broken by the work of the Messiah and by the power of the Holy Spirit. The tables can be turned. The demons that oppressed us now can be made subject to us. We don't need to give in to those things. And if we want to be Ahuds in our generation, we have to have the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, and the faith to press it into the enemy until the dirt comes out. Now, the dirt, that's a nice euphemism for dung. The stone Tanakh says the excrement came out. And that's what sin is like in the nostrils of God. So we need to plunge the sword of the Spirit into the belly of that fat Eglon, king of Moab, whatever that besetting sin is, come against it, with the word of the Lord, press it in by faith until the dirt comes out, until the dirt is out of your life and you've been delivered and then you have victory over the enemy. So if the Eglon in your life is growing fatter, listen for that blowing of the shofar from Mount Zion and believe that the Lord has delivered the Moabites into your hand, then take up the sword of the spirit, the word of God, thrust it deep into the bowels of Eglon's fat belly until Eglon inside you dies and the dirt comes out. So I hope that these words have encouraged you to overcome and to be victorious. Shalom.